This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Stephen Massacott's The Oxford Roof Climbers Rebellion is a wonderful new play dealing with the life of the British genius and cultural hero T.E. Lawrence and his equally brilliant friend Robert Graves. We are very happy to have Stephen Massacott here with us now. Stephen, what inspired you to write this play about the aging, although he was, what, in his 40s, T.E. Lawrence and his relationship with Graves? Uh, I guess uh, when I was 17 or 18, I saw David Lean's film, Lawrence of Arabia, and uh, <clears throat> up until then, my favorite movie was Star Wars and <laughs> Rocky. So uh, and after that, uh, Lawrence of Arabia became my favorite film. And then in my 20s, I, in my early 20s, I was writing, uh, I, was, I was teaching in the military, summer camps. <clears throat> and um, so I was reading a lot more of his biographies, learning about leadership and things like that. And then um, as I... Uh, was writing plays. I, I, I wrote a play called Mary's Wedding, which is a First World War play. And I'd r read Robert Gray's book, Goodbye to All That, which great, features, great yeah, it's a, really uh, out there. And uh, about four or five pages near the end of the book talks about meeting Lawrence at Oxford and striking up a friendship and some of the troubles that they were f feeling from the, left over from the war and uh, some of the pranks that they got up to. Uh, and when Mary's Wedding played at the National Arts Center of Canada, uh, the artistic director there, Marty Meriden, said to me that you know she wanted to commission me to write a play and what would I like to write about I said I'd like to write Lawrence about Lawrence of Arabia mm. so that was the when story. the play begins where, where is Lawrence Arabia in his life now he's been famous he's gone through the desert he the Arab revolt all that kind of stuff but now he's kind of being drifting drifting into retirement of sorts at, at Oxford with this nice comfortable teaching position yeah, he really didn't, really didn't know what he wanted to do. It, it's sort of, uh, the play ends up being a sort of sequel to uh, the movie because the events of the film transpired, the war, and then uh, now he doesn't really know what he wants to do with his life, and he's he's felt that the uh, the Arabs were completely betrayed, you know, in, uh, at the Paris Peace Talks. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, accepted a seven-year fellowship at All Souls to write his book, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. It's not in the play, but it, it was at one, per, at one point, but we cut it, um, uh, but it's true that he'd, uh, he'd finished writing the book and then he'd lost the complete manuscript. Oh, really? And at this point in the play, uh, in, this, in history, in, in the play, he's rewriting the book <laughs> from oh my memory. God. That's so, a uh, substantial manuscript to big, lose. Do, you know how we, do we know how he lost it? On a train from oh. London to Oxford. Really? Uh, um, but uh, uh, people claim that afterwards that they read the rewritten chapters that had written read some of the some of the other chapters yeah. of the book, uh, of the other draft, had claimed that they were virtually identical. So no uh, one knows for sure whether he staged it. Of well, course. he had a very strong <laughs> disciplined mind, to say the least. Yeah, uh, he, and I would believe that he'd be able to rewrite it again from memory. He's he had a brain like a. And steel what's trap. Robert Graves doing at Oxford at this point? Uh, Robert Graves had just come back from the war and was seriously wounded and nearly died at the Somme, and um, had just been married and had uh, two children, and he was only like twenty-four years old, and was studying English. And classics at Oxford and, and suffering from shell shock and sort of disillusionment, disillusionment with England after the war and what had, uh, you know, his idyllic uh, upbringing, Victorian Edwardian and then. So then you bring in the figure of mm -hmm. Lord Curzon, who, was who, is, who is the establishment himself, the yeah. Viceroy yeah. of India. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. represents the British Empire that these guys are <laughs> waging this guerrilla war against in Oxford. Yeah, Curzon was a you know, quintessential Oxfordian, I mean, uh, um, uh, Victorian and um, and uh, you know, the symbol of uh, all that they sort of yeah, the, the had symbol of the whole that, imperial problem right. to, that sent them off. And he had been a you know uh, uh, adversary to Lawrence in the, at the Paris Peace Talks, and had been appointed vice chancellor of Oxford. You know, so he was right in Lawrence's backyard, uh, or Lawrence was right in his backyard. They were like frat boys, weren't they? Sort of. Yeah, I think they were trying to go back to a, a time before the war. Both of them were trying to get back a memory from you know both had lost very close friends that they gone to school with and uh, relatives and Lawrence had lost two of his brothers in the war and I think they were you know it, it was sort of like going back to before the war they were chumming around and almost undergraduate type days and um, and there, um, there's the implication that some believe that they're having a, an affair it, it, was there any I mean, he, again we said Graves is married to a a, a woman, albeit a, a very feminist woman who dresses in men's clothes, but uh, do, is there any substantiation that there was an affair? I suppose one one could, you know, uh, read into it that way. Um, you know, up until then, Graves had a habit of leading on <laughs> uh, gay men like Sikh for Sassoon and things like this, and um, 
dabbling that way, I guess, you know, nothing really. Uh, I guess concrete. what I'm asking was more from the romantic perspective. Cause, do you because believe the that there, do you believe that there was a relationship yeah, between the two of them? I think so. They, they, Lawrence, they, you know, they had habits of, you know, uh, falling in love with men, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, um, whether I, I think it was probably rather uh, innocent, but, um, Certainly, they fell in infatuation with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think Graves helped write the Seven Pillars of Wisdom? Yeah, he did. He had. He he did. Uh, um, Which is not a readable book now, by the way. I think it's pretty. It's a. Uh, it's Dance. even for a real Dance. Lawrence fan. It's a heavy <laughs> read. You know? But Graves did have a hand in the writing of it. Yeah, he did do um, some um, uh, editing, uh, editing and uh, proofing for him. Uh, Lawrence well proofed a lot of Robert's poems, and um, Lawrence gave. Graves the right to write the first official biography of Lawrence, which was um, uh, Lawrence and the Arabs, which made Graves a lot of money <laughs> until until he wrote I Claudius down the road. Why was Lawrence held in such high? I mean, he was like a rock star in England before he he passed away. What 1935? Well, it's hard to say because uh, you know, for the most part, uh, his um, efforts in the Middle East had largely been failures. They yeah. were in the dream. They were in the dream rather than. Uh, yeah. But I think it ca captured a very romantic. Um, Ideal and and uh, American journalist by the name of Lowell Thomas. Oh yeah, done a made, made, lecture made. show yeah. and cr pretty much created the 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 idea and, and and it was almost the birth of this sort of uh, media. Didn't he work for the Chicago Tribune? I think so. He came over uh, and uh, spent a little time in the Middle East. Met Lawrence, did some talks, did some pictures, brought it back, and this show was selling out in London and uh, New York and uh, everywhere. And they did a lecture tour with slides. Oh yeah, yeah it yep, was yep. super popular. At first, it was you know the revolt in the desert, and then it became Lawrence of Arabia. You know, <laughs> and uh, did uh, Lawrence of Arabia? Did he love this? Did he love this attention? And then did he be did begin to believe the <laughs> his own myth? He, I think he had a real hard time with uh, the myth versus himself and, uh, and trying to keep those things together. Eventually, you know, he died as uh, officially named Shaw. He changed his name so he wasn't Lawrence anymore. He because he, was a, he loved Shaw. George Bernard Shaw. Yeah, he, he, was well, but he was a great, great friend of Shaw and he changed his Shaw. name to Shaw. Well, the, well, they said he changed his name because, because Lawrence had been illegitimate and, his, and he had changed his name several times throughout his life. Sort he of thought he wanted to pick his own his, name uh, yeah. and, and uh, get away from Lawrence of Arabia as much as he could. But he was utterly fascinated with it. He would go to the show many times. When, when Shaw wrote a play called Too True to Be Good. It has a character called Private Meeks in it, yeah. which is based on Lawrence. Lawrence went to see the show many times and then wrote Shaw, uh, you know, uh, nine pages of notes as to as to how to, how to improve <laughs> the character, improve his character. <laughs> uh, so he had this. Uh, Shaw coined this phrase about him that Lawrence had a knack for backing into the limelight. So every time he tried to escape the attention, he was walking right back into it. He seemed now, to court it. The, the, I mean, the larger issue of this play, of course, is this disillusionment, disillusionment with empire building. And not too hard to see the parallel with uh, what the United States is, some people say, we're doing in the Middle East. But is empire coming from the democratic West always a bad thing? I mean. British, the legacy of the British Empire is a is a mixed legacy. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, it's it's, it's tough now, and uh, you know this is happening in England now. That um, uh, imperialism is being taught in a, its positive lights as well as its you know ne negative light. Uh, you know that a lot of countries were their infrastructure was built by um, imperialism. Um, and democracy was first bought, brought there, and you know, roads and all manner of things were were created by. British well, I mean, you could say there's a direct link between um, uh, in the empire and the success now in India um, of their banking system because the English brought English to the Indians, and there are 800 million who speak English and now can get jobs in the global economy. Yeah, it's it's t it's uh, it's hard uh, hard to see that you know, and a lot of these countries would have hung back and sort of the Middle Ages, to so to speak. Um, you know, the British Empire did bring them into the 20th century, and then it was—it's like a, a child growing up, really, and then having the, then doesn't want anything to do with the parents after yeah, <laughs> after yeah. a certain point. Do you think Graves and, and Lawrence were ambivalent about empire ultimately as well, or were they just at this point against totally against, and they saw the evils that it caused? I think so. I think the the kind of empire uh, imperialism that Lord Curzon represented, they were. I believe they were against that. I think more so they were, and I think the message for me for the play is that the best thing to do, you know, is to concentrate on uh, your efforts on home as much as you can. Um, sometimes that sort of, you know, rampant looking elsewhere to, to, to go everywhere else um, ends up losing your, you end up losing your sense of self or, or well, where, isn't you, that, where you belong. Isn't that Lawrence of Arabia? 
Yes, on his he, desire to roam the desert, and, and then he couldn't figure out who the hell he was. Yes, but identity. much of what Empire was about is they they needed to look someplace else because home seemed so grim there in the British Isles. Yeah, that's yeah. unfortunately it. It seems like you know when uh, when you can give someone else advice. Yeah. It's so easy, and then you can't give your own you know, yourself your advice. I do that all the time, but everyone does that. It's so much easier to help everybody else's problem. Stephen Mascot's play about Empire and about two really phenomenal uh, characters, T. E. Lawrence and Robert Graves, is called the Oxford Roof Climbers Rebellion, and it's at the uh, Urban Stages. Urban Stages. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, thanks for being our guest tonight. Thank it's you. It's going very to be much. on until November sixteenth, seventeenth, November eighteenth. Eighteenth, I think. And, and we uh, hope it will extend. We hope so too. I just heard stop shopping. Is it at stop shopping? You say? Oh, I wish I should have heard this before. Give a gift out of love this season. I think it's excellent. It brings out a message of why people are so much into consumerism, and that um, we should really realize what is the true meaning of Christmas. What would Jesus buy? I don't think he'd buy anything in a Staples. The holidays are looming, and it's time for America to stop compulsive shopping. That's the message of the provocative new documentary, What Would Jesus Buy?, starring Reverend Billy and the Church of Stop Shopping. We're very pleased to be joined tonight by Reverend Billy's alter ego, performance artist Bill Talon, and the producer, director of the Church of Stop Shopping, Savitri D. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, hallelujah. She got Bill, through that. When I first met you, I got through it. When I, when I first met you, you were a lowly performance artist in Hell's Kitchen, just doing all kinds of provocative political things, and suddenly you found religion and became Reverend Billy. I what happened there? I don't remember feeling lowly. I was <laughs> no, but you were. But you were. You were. Well, I wouldn't say lowly, but I you was were, an egomaniac. You weren't. Yes. You weren't a religious figure. You were an actor. <laughs> you were an actor. <laughs> now, you're a political activist and the star of a major documentary. Amen. What happened? The disnifying of Times Square, as I remember the beginning. Uh, I lived in Hell's Kitchen at the time. I was watching powerless people, people of color, vendors, people with small shops, just powerless people. Do you remember? Rudy was just arresting people. And the Disney lawyers were everywhere. Uh, suing people, settling out of court, uh, just hustling the people that have been there decades to the wings. And in came Mickey Mouse. And I asked myself, who's shouting about this? Who, who's speaking up about what's happening to the Great White Way? And I, I decided it wasn't the Broadway theater. I decided it was the sidewalk theater, the, especially mm -hmm. the preachers. Not that I agreed with what they were saying, but they were shouting. And, and they so had I, a powerful technique. And I had a white coat from us, catering tables on the side, and uh, I got a, a, a little pine pulpit from a, a thrift store and a $5 um, collar, as the British say, the dog's collar. So uh, I started preaching in front of Mickey Mouse's high church of retail. And now you're traveling all over the country, all over the world, mm -hmm. with your church of stop shopping you have your own Amen. church of stop shopping choir, and you do these presentations. You do, you do these actions. Yes. Savitri, where did the church of stop shopping choir come from, and how do you get them to follow this guy all over the country? It's amazing. <laughs> At this point, there are 50 people on stage yes. when we do our, our whole revival show, and almost all of them have just come to us because they care about the message, really. They care about the, the politics of what we're doing. So. Most of them are performers and have worked in uh, theater or are singers, musicians, and they all sort of hear about it through the, the newspaper or a friend tells them or they see us in a store doing a performance. One of our singers came to us because she worked at Starbucks and we went in there and did an action mm -hmm. and she's like, oh. A conversion. <laughs> that save that girl's soul. Amen. Okay. And you have your, your, your revival meetings, which are very well attended now, Amen. and, and Amen. have become this, this movie, What Would Jesus Buy? But also, you go into places, which brings us to why you're not allowed in any Starbucks in California. <laughs> what is the story there? Sabatry and I are theater people. Yeah. And all the theater folks watching theater talk tonight, I mean, we, there's a, there's a moment 
when the air is shaking on stage with charged <laughs> magic, and we know there are moments when it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we'll never forget when it does. Yeah. And something happens in the whole place. The audience, the ushers, yes. mm -hmm. the people in the lights, time stands still. But we, what happened in Starbucks? We have the found that yeah. that happens when we are exorcising the Starbucks cash register. And we ask that the fabulous unknown, whatever you are who created us, drive the demons out of this cash register. Uh, and what does the manager then call the police and you usually get sort of... Yes, yeah, long before that moment, <laughs> the police are inside. Yeah, but don't they play into your hands then? I mean, the whole idea is to get publicity and attention for what you're doing. And they don't seem when to be a company aware like Starbucks Michael. goes after you, they elevate you and you get the New York Times and you wind That's up with right. a documentary. Well, it's massively inconvenient for us, though. We had to go to the West Coast We had to fly there three times. times. I mean, it does break your bank after a while, these oh, court, the court cases. Action. You know, so they right. know that, at least. They're just going to slow you down. And then, of course, when you have open court cases, right now we have three open, <laughs> it makes it difficult for us to continue that work. You know, but they're you, well within their rights, we have to say. I mean, if, you know, if I have a store, you come in and attack sure. my cash register and do that sort of stuff, I mean, I have the right as the owner to say, Knock it off, you know. Yeah. There are people here who are Absolutely. buying my goods and you're getting in their way. I'm going to, you know, call the police and I'm going to take an action out against you to keep you from disrupting They're my doing business. their job. That's yeah, fair. Yeah. That's yeah. fair. It's fair. I wanted to say the culmination of your film, mm -hmm. which is, it's, we'd say, is, it's about your odyssey across America to, to, to preach uh, about the coming shipocalypse, right? Morgan mm -hmm. Spurlock put five camera people in the buses with us and we went out across the country and we started in Times Square at the beginning of this preacher project on By Nothing Day, and then go out across the country trying to slow down the frenzy of... The frenzy. And you build... Shopping it. in the yeah. super malls and on the streets. But you're also talking about the disparity of wages that, like, for instance, you, you, you bring up the Disney company, mm -hmm. how they pay their laborers, creating their stuff for their stores, mm -hmm. and... It's such a general critique uh, that trying to slow down consumption in America. If you try <laughs> to do that, basic you would, economy. Yeah, you yeah. kind of wreck, so, you wreck everything, I'm afraid. Yeah. So we, we concentrate on certain things. The child hypnosis around the time of Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, the credit card uh, debt scams that go on. Um, the sweatshops, the union busting. We have certain things that we concentrate on. If we were able to get people to give gifts in a new way, or perhaps some would say in the old way, you know, with a feeling of reciprocity and community, love, family, and not just run up these bills. There's something that slightly bothers me, though, about your documentary. Um, mm -hmm. You go after, you know, the McDonald's, the Starbucks, the big corporations. You know, they can they can handle it fine. Mm -hmm. You know, corporations are evil right. from a certain perspective. Fine. But you then look at some of the consumers mm -hmm. in this movie. For example, a woman with her who buys all the stuff for her dogs. Right. Mm -hmm. And I get the sense, I mean, you, you, in some levels, you, you see them as victims of being manipulated by the corporations. But you also, I think, are kind of exploiting them in a way. I mean, they, they come across as ridiculous, pathetic, silly figures. Mm -hmm. And I found that was a little cruel, mm -hmm. that there was some malice towards these consumers oh, in your movie. I would have to disagree. All the people who uh, worked on this film, who per, you know, showed up in those scenes, they knew what the film was about. They weren't uh, taken by surprise, or um, we weren't tricking anyone into doing it. There were no hidden cameras or anything like that. And right. I, I think there's something untoward you know, about. Yes, yeah, so Michael was in the documentary wrong. booth. Go ahead. I'm not going <laughs> to say you're wrong. The the fact is that we have we have an emergency right now in the world and in our society, and Americans shopping is causing the climate crisis as much as anything is. We have, as theater people, we've got to poke some, some holes in the walls of our theater and notice that the ocean is rising. We've got to right. notice what's happening. And to make that statement clear, you're going to offend... There's some little people that you're, you're going to have to make fun of and ridicule. But Dr. King offended a lot of people. And Jesus Christ and Mahatma Gandhi and Victor Yara and Cesar Chavez. And any time society has shifted, there have been people that have been... I mean, I don't want to hurt those people. It's kind anyone. of smugness, though, I think, that comes out. Oh, when, when, you look at the, when you look at the little girl, you know, and she says, well, I have to have the new thing because mm -hmm. my friends have the new thing, and I'm very smart, but I need the new thing and all that kind of stuff. Well, we she also says something like, if everybody buys it, then I'm going to buy. I just feel like sometimes you have to buy your clothes at a certain place or else you won't be considered normal. People will laugh at you. Rumors will spread. 
and that is a bad thing. There's always, I think, an, a second thing they say which brings them closer to us, which is compassionate. And I, I think ultimately, and I really hope this is true, um, that it is a compassionate story. I mean, but crusading for, for the end of con the consumer culture and shopping, well, what, if you take that a step further, well, how would you then employ all of these people who work in this gigantic industry. Well, I mean, what we think is that a there's, diversity... There's jobs created for, you know, middle and working class people in this consumer culture. I mean, sure. the women who, who help you at the store, the women behind the cash register, if you take consumerism away, where do these people go well, to if work? you're talking about Walmart, usually that person has had the, his or her job destroyed when they were in a healthy economy. When the town was cooking along, Walmart came along, sucked the life out of that main street, well, Walmart would argue that they provide enormous numbers of jobs. Of course, but that, argument has, been, that is, argument has been dis disproven so long ago. I grew up in a small town, so I know small business mm -hmm. that. I got to say, I, you know, there aren't any Walmarts that I, I don't buy black and decker tools and all that kind of stuff. But when you walk into a place like Walmart or a Home Depot, they are bringing people lots of things that people would not have been able to have before that can be very useful in their lives. A small store can't give you maybe all the tools you want to build your own home, but something like a Walmart can bring that to you. And I don't understand why well, that's such a bad thing. people built their homes before Walmart, so they must Amen. come yeah. from somewhere. people, but it, you know. No. Oh. <laughs> I'd like to me. say, going back to theater for a moment, what was happening when the Reverend Billy Project started in, in Times Square is that I, I noticed that there was an attitude that there was no connection between what was happening with the independent shops and the sidewalks, the culture of the theater of public space, and the 50-foot wide Broadway stages. The, 50, the, the big stages, they were merchandising machines. They were at that point hitting their stride with it. it was, this is after Twilight and Bring to Noise and right. Angels in America. This is when they really started staging Hollywood movies that could be adapted to the stage, right. basically. I was looking at a depoliticized theater world, which disappointed me. But the, the, the disconnection, I thought, was a mistake. Ultimately, you have to have rich language and characters and New Yorkness and sassiness and lies and gossip. And, and you have to have that Demon Runyon uh, electricity in the streets, in the commons, in the environments. Yeah, but so along with that comes drug addicts that is just and the neighborhood. prostitutes and a healthy danger, neighborhood, which, that, which Times Square was A healthy the neighborhood there. as the best writing. People who know each other, who are telling each other stories, and that's what happens in independent shops. Is they the, the proprietor so, knows you, knows so. the products, and they start sh they start saying things. You go into a, a, a Home Depot, you go into a Walmart, you've got a hush, you've got Muzak, you've got corporate policies, you've got sweatshop products on the shelves, and you've got a kind of very, I think, anti-theatrical setting. It's bad theater. Walmart's bad theater. Amen. I know, I Where's my pipe in here? I, I, find, I find it very dramatic. I went to Walmart once. I thought it was wonderful and dramatic and all sorts of things you can look at and buy. Yes, and oh, and this, and <laughs> this is an interesting time to go about Times Square. And yes, I agree with you. It's lost some of its character. But, you know, on the other hand, it was a dangerous, seedy, awful place. So what, what are you saying? That, you know, I, I should be happy that... I should accept the fact that I could be mugged walking through Times Square in exchange for the fact that there's some vibrant street art going around. Well, as Fran Lee would say, I didn't know that Broadway was for 11-year-old people from Iowa. Well, but, you know, things <laughs> change, though, and maybe Broadway's <laughs> become for it. But you have clearly found a, an outlet for your kind of theater mm -hmm. somewhere else. Yeah, we have to I defend the neighborhoods that are still alive in New York, and there are a lot of them are, that are still healthy. But if they all go the way of Times Square, the town will just die. That's right. It'll and be very will, clean. Ultimately, the arts and theater will suffer. Speaking of Disney, the culmination of your film, you, you go to Disneyland and, mm -hmm. and, and do a, a stage in action on Christmas Day. You go, you all sneak in, then come in and bring out your choir robes, and you start to preach about, yeah. again, about the Shapocalypse. But the thing I was struck by at Disneyland are these these weary looking freaked out kids and obviously <laughs> that's been selected for the camp right? yes. this, this, mm -hmm. this, I think but, you find but, a lot of kids at Disneyland are quite happy to be <laughs> at Disneyland. But, but there's a, there's a, there is the stress of Christmas that I must have this thing, I must have this next thing that you really do show how the the consumer culture is, is so damaging to the psyche and soul sure. of people, children, and that's what you are talking about, almost as a true, although you're a bogus religious figure. Would you come to our next revival? <laughs> you might not say bogus so easily. It's at the Highline Ballroom. All right. And November 4th and December 2nd are the next two revivals All right. in the uh, Chelsea. Well, wonderful. <laughs> what would Jesus buy op uh, opening November 16th in, in your local theater across the country? And uh, 
Thank you so much, Reverend Billy. Change Bill Power. Julius, Susan. St. Michael, thank you. Thank you. I'll see you at Bloomingdale's. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to get some friends, you gotta some, stop some gifts for Christmas. Brother. We'll be out front with a bull. <laughs> I want I want to Susan you. Right here. Uh, and I'll see you at Walmart. Where's your local Walmart, Michael? <laughs> I like Walmart. Yeah. I, just, I like house things to build houses with. I Let's go there together and change. I bought that some place. fertilizer at the Home Depot once. It was and we're reminded. It was cheap. Goodbye, everybody. It's the Cinema Village. Good Amen. night. We have the magic. It is stopped. The corporation stole Christmas. We can take it back.